and fear is chasing after me. Whatever trouble I am facing, I will lift my hands and sing. I believe in miracle power, in a wonder-working God. I am filled with the Holy Spirit. He's working wonders in my heart. I belong to a loving Father, and I'm a friend of Christ His Son. When it feels like I won't make it, I call on Jesus. There was no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Last Lent, we introduced um, a song called This Is Our God, and we're just going to continue to praise him and celebrate him for who he is and who he is in our lives. Life. 
like mountains that stood in our way. But he came and he died and he rose. Those giants are dead now. This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross. posture you need as we go to the Lord in prayer together. The altars are open all service long. You don't have to wait for a special invitation. You can sit at your seat, kneel at your seat, stand, whatever posture you need as we pray together. In the season of Lent, we are anticipating and waiting for God's movement in a fresh way. So we pray this morning with our hearts aligned with Psalm 27 verse 14. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Would you pray with me, church? Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with us today. As we come into this place to worship you together, we are coming in from so many different situations. For many of us, we are in a season of what feels like forever, waiting for you to move. Maybe it's in our own heart with something we've been struggling with in our thoughts and in our mind. Maybe we've been waiting for you to move in our relationships with other people. God, for some of us, we come in here waiting for you to move by providing a way forward in our life for our family, for our finances. Lord, maybe for our health. God, we have so many different needs that we confess to you this morning, trusting that if we wait 
for you that you will come to us, you will meet us. God, would you fill this place and our hearts and our minds and our prayers with your Holy Spirit. God, we want to praise you with all that we are and we need your help to do that as you carry us through the hard parts of our lives. So God, we give to you all that we are this morning, our needs and our brokenness and our hopes and our joys. Lord, your church is here. We are waiting. Would you come and grace us with your presence? We pray together as your church in the strong name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Would you continue standing as we sing praise? So we've got a new song this morning, and um, Pastor Peter was actually the one that introduced us um, to it, and we were talking about what the sermon series was going to be going forward into Lent, and it just fits. It's so perfect, and I don't want to step on his toes when he comes forward to bring the word, but in John 15, we're talking about that kind of abiding in Jesus, and you know, this song, I feel like, is an invitation, not just for those moments that we can find those quiet times to abide in God and who he is, but it's an invitation to that all the way kind of life where every provision is from God. So as we just ready our hearts this morning and then we're entering week one of the Lenten season, let's just, this is gonna be our hearts cry our anthem for this season.
Psalm 145, 3, great is the Lord and highly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. Great are you, Lord. We're so grateful.
and in awe of your greatness. Let me take a moment just to be humbled at the thought. It's your breath in our lungs. You control our sleeping and our waking and the sunrise and the sunset. In that humbleness, Lord, just help us to feel so small and held in your arms. Help us to abide in you. And as we learn what that word means and what that looks like in our lives through the, the words I know you'll give Pastor Peter through this series, I just ask that you open ears and hearts. May everyone that's in here hear exactly what you need them to hear. And as we fix our eyes towards the cross, as we move through this Lenten season, Lord, just help us to remember what a remarkable, remarkable gift you gave us through the life of your son. I pray for everyone that's in this room and every family represented. You know exactly what they're all going through, the spoken and the unspoken, Lord. Just ask that you touch them exactly where they need it and bring us all back here next week to hear what you have for us as well. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Good morning, Center Point Church. <laughs> if you don't know me, I'm Pam Guernsey. I'm the NMI president, and NMI stands for Nazarene Missions International. So we're a global church. So um, as part of the global church, we're going to be collecting our alabaster next Sunday. So if you don't have a box, go grab one. You can fill it with a check. You can fill it with dollar bills. You can fill it with coins and bring it back next Sunday, and we'll get it all in. Um, in the bulletin, you have a pledge card. It's for Faith Promise. And Faith Promise is giving above and beyond your tithes, and you do it by faith. Um, the offering is used, there's a list of different offerings on the pledge card, and we use it to either bump up funds or to actually send funds in to these different offerings. They're all special offerings, and also in the bulletin, you can see um, Alabaster, last year we raised 2,164.22, but with Faith Promise, we were able to bump it up $1,835, and so send in, as a church, we sent in 4,000 instead of the 21, which is great. <laughs> And then for deputation offerings for our missionaries that do come and visit us, we, were, we raised 2,400, but with Faith Promise, we were able to send in 6,600 for the different missionaries that came and visited us, which is great. Um, we do have a missionary, um, the Memorial Health Care role that we do, and then mission, World Mission Broadcast, and then there's District Projects, and then Compassionate Ministries. So we were able to send in extra funds for all of those givings due to faith promise so this week i need you to pray about what god will want you to give towards faith promise you can do it weekly bi-weekly monthly or as a one-time giving but all the money that give that people give towards faith promise 100 percent of it goes out to the missions so please pray about that thank you Thank you, Pam. Yes, bring the pledge card back next week. I just have to say, I've been in the Church of the Nazarene more than half my life, and I've never been in the church quite so faithful in its engagement with missions around the world that takes being a part of a global church family as seriously as we do here. Pam's leadership of our NMI is a big part of that, and I think definitely uh, Pastor Chad and Crystal set the tone for that as well and our chance to send them. So. There's a lot of cool ways that you can be a part of that. I want to I echo what Pam said to invite you into that in, as we pray for or next Sunday. If you don't know what Alabaster is, those funds go directly to build buildings in different missions areas. We actually had missionaries here last month who the district office for the Panama district was built with Alabaster funds. So if you ever wonder what happens with that, 
the pastors receive their training and pray together and discern the direction for the church in Panama in a building that the coins in the little boxes have helped build. So you've been a part of that, even though you maybe didn't know specifically, you've been a part of that. Well, as we continue in our service, a couple of other things we want to help you keep in the know on that you can be a part of. Two weeks from today, March 3rd, we are having our annual church meeting. It may not sound very exciting if you've never been to our church meeting. Uh, So a couple of things that happen there. One will be electing our half of our church board. So our church board is elected biannually for two-year stints, so half the board is up for re-election, and we have a committee that prays and discerns who to nominate, and you, members, get to vote on that. If you're a member, you get to vote on the church board, and that is a big part of your ministry and their ministry that the church has confidence in them as leaders. But also, in addition to that, we take the advantage, we choose to, on that Sunday, take advantage of the opportunity there to share some vision and how things have been going in the church, report to you how the ministries have been, and set some vision for the year ahead. So on that day, March 3rd, you'll get to hear from me and some of the rest of the team and the staff what God's done last year, and then some of our vision for what we believe God's leading us into in the future. And to make that even more sweet, if you were like, wow, I just can't wait to hear Pastor Peter talk more after church we're going to do a potluck lunch that day. So, so we'll actually get to share a meal together, and as we're sharing that meal, hear an update on the church ministry. We think it's important that you know what is going on in the church. Not all of us are a part of every ministry, but we want to keep you in the know on how we're using the tithe money you contribute to the church and how we are serving with the energies and the vision of this church. So that's in two weeks. You're going to want to be a part of that. Sign up for the potluck or out in the lobby. We'd love for you to join us. Also coming up, District Celebrate Life is a youth event coming up next month. It's a chance to use your different talents and gifts God's given you as a teenager for the Lord, not just to compete for some other trophy or accolade, but to celebrate the life God's given you. I I can't say enough good things about Celebrate Life. You're going to want to go. It's a great time. If you need more info, talk to me or talk to Crystal, and we'll get you guys sorted out with that. Finally, um, we are going to take an opportunity now to pray over our families as we continue in our service this morning. So I want to invite you to pray with me as we pray over our families together. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you give us this church family to call home. And Lord, we also thank you for our, our families, God, for our children, for our parents, for our siblings. God, we know that they are a gift from you. Help us to honor you with the way we treat one another. And God, that's our cry as a church, that every age, Lord, from the youngest all the way to the oldest, we would learn to love one another well. Would you be with our children and our youth as they worship you today? Would you be with their leaders as they worship together? And even at this, their young age, Lord, would you continue the work you're already doing in their hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit to win them over to you in a fresh way this morning? Be with us today as we worship you together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Kids, you guys can head out. Teens, you can head as well to to your respective worship areas. The rest of you, would you turn in your Bibles to John chapter 15? If you would like to have a, a Bible with you as we start our time together, on the altar back there below that slope staircase, we have some new Bibles that are um, that have bigger print than our old. Bibles that we had for borrowing. So if you want one, you can go ahead and grab one. It'd be a great opportunity for you to see this with your own eyes and, and to get um, kind of get that feel of having access to it. The thing I don't want to do as your pastor is make you think that you can only access the scriptures through me as a filter. The Bible is our book belongs to the church, not just to pastors, not just to teachers and leaders. And that's why I always ask you to turn in your Bibles, because you have every right and are called by God to read it too. Well, we're going to have it up on our screen. You'll notice that the version on our screen is the NIV, but some of the words have been shifted so that all the scripture would reflect the, uh, the same Greek word. So there's lots of words in there for abide. I've put abide in there over and over again to really drive it home for us. Church, would you hear the word of the Lord this morning? I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so it will be even more fruitful. 
You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Abide in me as I also abide in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must abide in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not abide in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Heavenly Father, would you speak to us through your scripture this morning? Guide my words to reflect your truth. Guide our hearts to hear and to respond to what you have for us. Teach us, Lord, to abide in you, even as we abide in you by studying your scripture together. We pray these things together in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, church, you've heard it a few times this morning. We are in the season of Lent. And if you're unfamiliar with that term, Lent is a season of preparation for celebration of resurrection at Easter. It's a season of naming our brokenness, declaring our need for Jesus, and ultimately it's a season of making space in our lives for God to move, for God to speak to us, and for God to fill us. So if you've seen or you've heard people giving something up for Lent, what they're actually doing, they're not making a sacrifice to God. If I don't drink coffee, he'll love me. They're saying, I'm gonna take this specific thing and pull it out of my life so there's more space there for God to fill and for God to be present with me and for me to experience God in this season of preparing. So if that's something you feel led to do, I encourage you to do it. We're going to talk in the weeks ahead about some different practices we can take on and we can participate in as we learn to abide in Jesus. Because I believe Lent isn't just about giving something up. I think maybe even more important is taking something on so we can experience God's presence in a fresh way. So you'll see on uh, every other seat, I don't, I don't think I have one up here to wave it around and show you. I've got these little cards that we put together uh, for you for this season. We just got done with a season where we were reading through the book of Matthew together, one chapter a day. And I have to tell you, many of you shared that it was really helpful to know what sort of thing to be reading. I know a lot of us maybe have Bible reading practices, but every now and then we fall out of the habit, and then you hear the preacher say we need to read the Bible, and you don't know where to start. And the enemy will take any excuse to stop us from responding to God. So if we want to hear God and respond to God, this is a really practical way for you to do that. On the one side, you've got our passage, John 15. You've got a simple prayer to pray before you read the chapter for that day, which is on the back side, which chapter to read. And then you've got at the end of it, if you don't really know, okay, I read the Bible, how do I end this time? We have printed there the Lord's Prayer that if you don't know what to pray, you can just read through and pray that. It's a great way to get started. And if you already have a, a devotional time, It's short enough, you can add it in there so that we're participating together. I really want to encourage you to take that on this season. As we go through through this sermon, maybe you'll feel more uh, drawn that way, but I want to name that so that you can can pray about that as we go through our time together. Because ultimately what abiding means is being in God's presence. There's lots of ways we could do that. But this word abide, I don't know that we use it a lot in our day-to-day life. I don't know... If you've used it this week, except for maybe the, the praise team and the, the tech team, because we've, we've known that's the series that's coming. But I don't really say like, oh yeah, Ron and I went to, to the Coney Island and we abided together. We don't, we don't use that word like that. So I want to give some images of what, what this kind of means. The, the, the beautiful part, the beautiful thing about abiding in Christ is that it's this power of Christ's presence in our life. So there's lots of other ways that we understand this term abide that I want to help us key into to catch an imagination. If you've ever been in nature, maybe you've gone hiking. Anyone here gone hiking before? I love hiking. Anyone ever gone backpacking? That's like hiking plus, where you like have to carry your stuff with you. There's something about being in nature, abiding in the presence of the trees and the birds chirping and the nature that just, it does something to you. 
It's not that you're necessarily doing something with nature back and forth. Just being in that space takes an effect on you as you kind of rest in and abide in nature. It's relaxing. It's rejuvenating. For many of us, it's very refreshing just to go see some green. We're not to those slides yet, uh, Bryn. Sorry about that. The... Uh, there's other ways we can abide. I mentioned it before. We can abide with other people. This is something that we maybe all get. There's a difference between going and doing something with someone. So like when my in-laws were in town last fall, they decided we were going to mulch the front beds at the parsonage. That was their decision. They're like, we're going to help you do that. And we just kind of made a week out of it. And that's something very productive. But underneath the thing we were doing, we were abiding in each other's company. We were just with each other in a way that left us all different than if we hadn't been together. For Bree and I, we abide with going to farmer's markets. Sometimes it's just as simple as watching TV. These are ways that we just are with each other in each other's presence so that we can receive from the other person what their presence brings with them. Sure, there's things that I've removed from my life so that I can feel connected to people, but it wouldn't be enough to just remove the distractions from my life, at a certain point, I need to actually go be in nature, be with my wife, be with my family, or be with you guys. Abiding is not just removing something, it's actually taking on something. Choosing to prioritize being with and in the presence of something or someone. Well, this is important for us because we want to be a church who hears God's voice and responds to God's voice and in this passage, we hear from Jesus that we need to depend on him. Apart from him, we can do nothing. So we need to abide in Jesus. You heard it in the song that we depend on Jesus for everything. Our daily bread, our breath, our sleep, the sun to rise. So if we're going to be intentional about abiding in Jesus, well, what does this word mean? I've got for you the Greek word here that I replaced with abide. Sometimes it's to remain or to abide, it just, it's pronounced as just the way it's written. It's the word meno. Say it with me, meno. Meno. To abide, to remain. Some other ways to define this word to help us get our head around it. It means to, to sojourn, to go on a journey with. To tarry. Who, who uses the word tarry? Just kind of meander with. To stay present to, to. To be held. To be kept. Continually kept. Not just for a moment but to be continually held on to. It means to continue, to last. You know, you can spend a moment with another person, but to continue and to last and to endure with them, that constant abiding with them. It means to survive, to live, to wait for and to await. You could maybe even say it's to wait with. This word, abide is getting at all of these ideas. It's not just a passive thing. It's focused on presence and the way that holds us and keeps us and fills us and helps us to endure, survive, last, to remain and to wait and to await Jesus. This is really important for those of us who want to live a life of significance. A life of purpose. Because most of us, I would say, want to do something that matters. And in the scripture, often this is described as bearing fruit. We don't just want to coast through life and one day go in a box in the ground. When we get to that moment, when we, pass, when we are trying to pass what my pastor I grew up with called the box test. The things that people will say about us and remember about us when we're in a box ready to go in the ground... When that moment comes, the question will be, what fruit have come out of our life? Just like a plant or a vine growing fruit, our lives do that. What kind of things have we brought into this world? What kind of things have been brought into the world through us is maybe a more Christian way to say that. Well, this is what Jesus is talking about. He says here in verse 8, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. So God's desire for us is that we bear fruit. This is good news. We, we aren't just supposed to coast by and twiddle our thumbs and wait to go to heaven one day. It's to God's glory that we are a part of what God's doing, that it, we bring into this world by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. 
some fresh and new and beautiful things that reflect who God is. So that part of you that yearns for purpose and to do something that matters and to be a part of what God is doing, Jesus is pointing us to that. But the beautiful thing about this passage is Jesus does not say, if you work very hard, then you will bear much fruit. He says, if you abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. This is important for us because many of us, once we've caught this vision of what Jesus wants for us, we try to do it ourselves. It's like when you, if you've ever gotten instructions from a family member, maybe it's a spouse or a parent, and before they really finish explaining where that thing is you're supposed to go grab them or, you know, how to really set up, maybe you're supposed to, I've made this mistake before, I was supposed to set the crock pot to high and I've not even turned it on before, I just put the soup in it, right? You, you kind of hear the instructions and you take off. You're like, okay, all right, I've got it, I'm gonna go bear fruit. Many of us do that in our faith. We go, okay, you want me to love other people? I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna work so hard. I'm gonna be so faithful. I'm gonna be the most loving person in the world. Not that it's a contest. But we skip the part about abiding in Jesus. And here's the problem with that. All of us are abiding in something. We are remaining, sitting, waiting in something. Maybe it's anxiety. Maybe it's workaholism. You just work and work and work like finally you'll love the person in the mirror if you could just work enough. Maybe you think that you could actually do some good in this world if you were financially secure enough. Finally, now that I have the money, now I can start being generous and loving people. There's something else, some other idea we're abiding in. But Jesus says, and this is quite a harsh word, but it's in red letters here in the New Testament. Jesus says it to us. Apart from him, we can do nothing. Not a little bit. He doesn't say, apart from me, you, you'll miss it sometimes. Jesus doesn't say, apart from me, you'll only bat 300, you know, 300 instead of 1,000. Apart from me, you'll make it on base every now and then. Apart from me, you'll be an all right friend, a meh spouse, an okay church person. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. I don't know about you, I don't want to get to the box test and have done nothing. I want to be a part of what God's doing in the world. I want to actually lean into this purpose God's inviting us into. If it's to God's glory that we bear fruit, then I want to bring glory to God with the life that I live. How many of you guys have ever had Captain Crunch before? There's a couple different varieties. Have you ever seen the oops all berries Captain Crunch, they just take the Captain Crunch part out. I'm pretty sure it's the same flavor, the berries and the regular part. Like, I don't think it's different, but like, they'll sell us anything. Some of us live an oops, all fruit version of discipleship. No abiding, just, oh, the whole box is just me trying harder, just me doing more. This is really, really problematic for us. And I, I have a testimony of, of seasons in my life where this has been the case. Last summer, or last spring rather, I, I kind of started to notice in my life I was getting what we would call burnt out. I was doing the things I needed to do, but the joy wasn't there. I was tired all the time. I, I get like a tight jaw, like I'll wake up with my jaw clenched. I had headaches. Things were really even though everything on the outside looked fine, and you maybe didn't notice as a part of the church, you know, maybe on Sunday. I know some of you did. You check on me. When I come in the door, you know, someone, uh, oftentimes it's our board members who see me all the time. They'll say, are you okay, Pastor? I say, yeah, you know, just long week. But I started to wear down. Here's the thing. Because I was feeling tired, what I decided to do was to relax more. More time playing video games, more time you know, having like a nice snack or a nice treat, more time napping or sleeping in, and I thought relaxing and vegging out was gonna be the thing that helped me to keep bearing fruit. But church, can I tell you that vegging out and relaxing are different than abiding. Just doing the things that make us feel good are not the same thing as abiding in Jesus. So often, I've, I've heard it said by people, oh, you know, like, you know, I'm really tired, I just need a break. 
Yes, God has baked into our being a rhythm of rest. We need rest. He invented the Sabbath, the day of rest, for us. He knows we need it. I've always found it interesting that the scripture asks us to give a tenth of our money and a seventh of our time to the Lord, to Sabbath, just to rest. A higher percentage of our time is supposed to be spent on resting than a percentage of our money on supporting the ministry of the church. It's on the same list of commandments as not murdering and not committing adultery. God takes rest very seriously. But there is a difference between just doing nothing and abiding in Jesus. And I had my wires crossed on what this meant. And I started to get this sense of this verse right here, apart from me, you can do nothing. It just felt like I couldn't do anything. I was exhausted. And then late May rolled around. My friend Ruth asked if we would pray about, and I'd present to the board, this opportunity for us to run the Detroit Marathon with Team World Vision. And for some reason, even though it sounded terrifying, just in my gut, I knew immediately this is what the Lord was inviting us into. And so we pitched it the second week of June, and, and a number of us decided, you know what, we're going to, that verse in Romans 13, I offer my body as a living sacrifice. We literally did that. We offered our bodies for hundreds of hours running and training. And can I tell you that running that marathon, that time in silence and in pain, even though it was not relaxing, for me became a way of abiding in Jesus. I don't offer that as some way to pat myself on the back. I want to say to you, there's been seasons, even as your pastor, where I'm, con I'm trying harder to bear fruit rather than committing to abiding in Jesus. And he catches me every time. If you spend enough time in the scripture, you won't be able to stay in that season of workaholism for long. He will stop you with the biblical demand to rest. And weirdly, the rest my soul needed was exhausting to my body. This was a way for me to abide in Jesus. Now, before you start to think, wow, I've got to do some crazy hard stuff for Jesus to give me rest. This is not about working to earn rest. It's not that I was doing something hard for God and then God decided he would bless me with restfulness. It's about being in God's presence. There's a lot of ways to do this. This is just one example from my life. Maybe the examples I used before would, would be more fitting for you. Hiking, being in nature. For some of us, it's gardening. I know many of us, gardening feels very much like being connected to God. There's these unique ways. We've been wired to experience God's presence. But we don't do certain things to earn the right to abide. We don't work hard and then rest. In the biblical imagination, the Sabbath, the day of rest, is the first day of the week. We begin with resting in God, and then we bear fruit. So many of us think, and we, we buy into what our culture tells us. How do you bear more fruit? Well, you go bear more fruit. But the scripture tells us that actually you start with abiding, and only then. Only then can we bear the fruit God has for us. We begin with rest, and only from a place of rest can we do the work. Even Jesus does this. The night before he is killed, he's in the garden, praying, abiding. He could have just taken a nap. He could have just had physical rest. But he needed to abide in the presence of the Father to prepare himself for the work he was about to do. Church, if Jesus needed to abide in God's presence, perhaps it's okay that we do too. Maybe this is the way God designed us. Not to work for Jesus, but to live life with Jesus. There's a difference there. We're not to prove to God we are really faithful and that we finally earned a break, but to relax into God's presence so we can then go and serve God faithfully. And I think this is what Jesus is keying into in this passage. Because he knows that the vision he's casting for the kingdom of God is so beautiful and worthwhile that many faithful disciples will sprint toward it, leaving Jesus behind, doing what we can in our own strength. He knows that many of us are zealous and earnest and hardworking, and we will take that posture and try to do the kingdom work on our own. And he catches us and invites us to abide in his presence. Here's the beautiful thing about this word abide. We, we sang it earlier. 
there's a line that says, teach me to abide. Teach me to abide. This is not a special gift that some Christians get to have. You may be thinking, okay, pastor, that's great. Some people get to experience God's presence, and they have a great time when they pray and read the Bible. That's just for certain class of special, really spiritual Christians who, if they've been born a thousand years ago, may have been monks or something. For the rest of us, we don't get to abide in Jesus. We've got to get to work. There's some kingdom work to do. We need to be faithful. But Jesus wants us to understand that we can learn to abide. And it won't feel natural at first. Our culture tells us our goal is to work hard, earn our living, do things that prove we're someone who matters. Only then can we rest. We work for the weekend. We push too hard just trusting a vacation is coming. Whereas God flips the script. It says actually you work from a posture of rest. You abide first and then you bear fruit. This is why we come to church the first day of the week. Instead of, okay, everyone go be faithful. And if you were faithful, God will give you some sort of golden ticket. You can come to church. No, we start right here Sunday morning, abiding in his presence together. Because that's the only way we're going to make it during the week. That's the only way we're actually going to be able to bear fruit is if we abide in Jesus. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. But the good news is, church, we don't have to be apart from Jesus. That's what I love about this passage. Rather than feeling like we, he doesn't say, you can't do anything. I do it all. He says, apart from me, you can't do anything. Therefore, abide in him. Abide in Jesus. Sojourn, tarry, slow down with Jesus. Maybe that's the best way to put it. Abiding is slowing down with Jesus. Not working for him, being with him. If you have this sense that you feel like you can't do it. You, you get this, this sense that you can't make the changes you need to make in your life. You are trying everything. You've read every self-help book. You've tried all these different strategies. You've got, you know, if you're like me, maybe you struggle with waking up in the morning. I've, I've got this new alarm app that makes me do math questions before it'll turn off. You know, you come up with these little tricks. Now I'm going like, to eat less sugar before bed. Then I'll be able to wake up and read my Bible. We come up with everything in the book except abiding in the presence of God so we can do more. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. That doesn't mean apart from Jesus, those of us that are really good can still get a little something done. Everything in this life that matters and is worth doing, we cannot do apart from God. But we don't have to be apart from God. That's what we're going to focus on this season of Lent. There are so many different ways we can abide in Jesus, and we're going to work through a couple of these different things. One of them is that card that was on your seat. There's lots of specific ways we can abide in Jesus. Maybe you hate nature. One of, one of my role models and one of my great friends, she, she used to be my boss at the Chamber of Commerce. She's a go-getter. She's energetic. She's, she's so passionate about ministry and about everything else. She just doesn't like warm weather. She doesn't like to sweat. So for her, hiking, no. That's not really abiding. That would not be relaxing into God's presence. But maybe it's something else. A new one that I've, I've started in my life is going to the gym. And it gives me this chance to like be alone with Jesus before I'm ever with another person. Now, like, I, I like to think I'm a pretty nice guy. You could ask my wife. Not always, right? You don't always, you don't always get to see the, the uglier side of me. I am a much... I'm a much less fruitful husband when I don't abide in the Lord in the morning, when I don't have that time of reading scripture and praying. And for me in this season, it's also been working out. One of the ways I abide with Jesus is by abiding with y'all. I love being with you. Sunday, I, I know people joke that Sunday the pastor's working. I would not make it Monday through Saturday without being with you guys on Sunday. When I'm on vacation, I know pastors, when they're on vacation, they'll be like, I'm not going to church. It's the one week I don't have to. I can't afford to miss church. And I go sit in some other church, and I pray for you, and I think about you. Because one of the ways that God has helped me to abide in him is by being with you. It's fellowship. Now, there's lots of specific ways you're wired to abide in Jesus. But there's some general ways we're all invited into. Fellowship is one of them. Worshiping God together is one of them. Now, there, I don't think there's a Christian on this planet who can say, you know, worshiping God's just not for me. It's just, it's just something, some Christians do it, praising God's name. 
is not for me. I think that's something we're all invited to abide in. Now, you, I, I don't abide by playing drums, right? But I'm sure, Ron, you have moments where you're worshiping the Lord as you play drums. For me, it's standing right there. Fellowship and praising God is one of those ways we're all invited into. Yes, there's personal ways, but there's ways we're all invited into. Reading the Bible is one of those. Now, I get it. Reading the Bible or listening to the Bible be read on an app on your phone or, or you can get the Bible on CD, that's not easy. And I just want to name that. When we started marathon training, you can ask anyone that did the Team World Vision marathon or half marathon, right? So a lot of us are here. You could ask Miguel. You could ask Ryan. It didn't come naturally. The first time you go running, it's terrible. It's an acquired taste. And then you start to acquire the taste. The Bible is like that. You don't enjoy it the first time. It's confusing. It's 2,000 years old, some of it even older. But you start to acquire the taste. And church, I want to tell you, if it's difficult at first, it's not because you're a debunked or broken Christian. It's difficult at first. But we're all invited to abide in Jesus by abiding in the scripture. He says here that if we abide in him and his words abide in us. Psalm 119.11 says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. We are all invited to abide in the scripture. Not just some Christians who are a little, who take to it naturally. And I would argue they don't take to it naturally. They work at it. We're all invited into the scripture. We're all invited into prayer. This is one of the reasons that I love written prayers. Now, you may think it's not authentic if it's written. I have to tell you, I bought my wife a Valentine's Day card, and I hand wrote some of it, but they come with words in them, right? You ever seen that? And she said it was her favorite card she's ever gotten from me. Were those words not true of our relationship because someone else wrote them? No, I would have bought a different card. Like, I wouldn't have bought one that was a lie. I try to be truthful and honest with her always. They still had meaning, even though I didn't write them myself. Many of us feel ashamed that we would feel like we don't know how to pray. Some of us feel, will say, Lord, I'll pray, but I'm never praying out loud in front of other people. Praying a written prayer is a great way to learn the language of prayer. That's why that card has the Lord's Prayer on it. Because when Jesus was asked to teach us to pray, he taught us that prayer. It's not cheating, it's not a shortcut, it's not fake. It's not inauthentic. Our culture will tell you, if it didn't come from your own brain, it means nothing, it's not authentic. When Jonah was in the belly of the whale, he quoted scripture. When Christ was on the cross, he prayed scripture. It's okay to pray the Psalms, to pray the Lord's Prayer. Every morning before I do my devotionals, since I invited you to do this, I've been in the practice of praying Samuel's Prayer. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And I mean those words more and more every time I pray it. Prayer is something we're all invited into. It's not for a special class of Christians who have the gift of prayer. Now, we might connect to some of these at different levels. Maybe you need more of one or more of another. We're all different, but we're all invited into these. You are not excluded from them. You can abide in Jesus in these ways. Praising God, praying, reading the scripture, fellowshipping together. Maybe for you, you're thinking of some specific things in your life. A couple of other things we're all invited into, serving. I can't tell you how many times the Lord has spoken to me when I thought I was doing work for God. Actually, I was in God's presence. Ask the people who serve here. Ask anyone who's been on the food team for a funeral here at this church. God moves even when we're, when we think we're the ones doing the work, he's actually working in our hearts. Serving God is a way to abide in Christ. I know that may seem like it contradicts the fruit thing, Remember, we serve in Christ, not just doing something for God. There's a difference there. Stillness, this is a hard one. This is maybe the easiest one to go. Some Christians, they can do stillness. Not me. Some Christians can sit in silence. Not me. But can I tell you in the scripture, often it's the still, small voice of God. Not the loud voice of thunder that reaches us. And if we never stop, and pause and slow down, we should not be surprised we don't hear the Lord's voice. Imagine a conversation with a friend where you talk nonstop. Are you gonna hear him say anything? No. So when we say, I wanna hear God speak, well, guess what? He gave us the scripture. and He gave us stillness just to sit in the Lord's presence. It's not easy. These, are, these things are all an acquired taste. They don't necessarily feel natural. 
but they are faithful. And they're a way to abide in Jesus. So before we skip ahead to something that maybe is uniquely about the way you're wired, maybe it's running or exercise, maybe it's nature, maybe, maybe you really connect to God when you're washing the dishes. If so, that's great. I bet your family loves that. Maybe you connect to God when you're cleaning something or when you go for a walk or when you just people watch while you're out at the diner and you just remember that God's made so many different people all in his image. There's ways that are unique to you that you can abide in Christ. But before we run off and start trying to get creative, let's start this series. Let's start Lent with the basics that we know are an invitation for all of us to read the scripture, to pray, to worship together, to fellowship. And as that fills us up, we're invited to serve. And you might even be invited to sit in silence this season. If you're feeling drawn to that one, I want to give you some handles for that. Just do one minute of silence. One minute of silence. That may sound like, oh, that's not much. I'm going to start with ten. Start with one. If this is something you struggle with, start with one. You're like, oh, pastor, I want to read more than one chapter of scripture. That's, that's great if you, feel like, if you feel led to do that. But start with that one that we're reading together. And trust that God can multiply that. But God will multiply our abiding in him. You don't have to learn it all at once. God will teach you to abide in him. This is the journey of a lifetime. This is the work of the Christian faith. We'll get into some specifics in the weeks to come of how you can abide in Jesus and the way that you can hear and respond to God through that. But I really want to encourage you to, to commit in a fresh way to this, this season of Lent. Just be hopeful enough that God might do something with your time at church and your time in the word, your time in prayer. I want to invite the praise team forward as we, we're going to sing that song again. We need to be taught to abide. This isn't something we're born understanding. This isn't something that, that some of us just get. It is difficult. And we want to sing to our God the way that we need him to teach us, to proclaim how we need God. So if you felt like you're not good enough and you can't get it right, the good news is that apart from Jesus, you can do nothing and you don't have to be apart from Jesus anymore. Church, would you take whatever posture you need, whether it's standing or sitting, as we sing. Heavenly Father, as we sing your praise, speak to our hearts. Teach us to abide in you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, I depend. 
When I pass through death as I enter rest, I depend on you. I depend on you. morning and we confess that we depend on you for for everything lord some of us come this morning having felt shame that we need to depend on you we felt that we need to do it on our own and god we give that to you today we trust that you're dependable and faithful faithful to give us everything we need so god as we start this season of abiding in you Would you give us the strength and the conviction and the dedication to take up these practices together as your church? God, we know that you desire for us to bear fruit and to be faithful, to be a part of your work in the world. God, we know we can't do it on our own. Lord, would you help us this week to lean in, to step into this season of abiding in your presence in a fresh way. Lord, we pray that you would meet us there by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would meet us in every word of scripture we read and in every prayer we pray and in every line we sing from a a Christian song, Lord, would you meet us in our time with our family? When we get in our cars, Lord, whatever it is that we're doing as we give that space to you, would you meet us there? Meet your church. Fill us with your presence. We pray this together in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Church, I want to invite you to your feet this morning as you're left with a blessing. Don't forget sign-ups in the lobby for the potluck in two weeks. You're going to mark that on your calendar. Be here for that vision Sunday, that church meeting. And take that card with you. It's kind of bookmark size. You can throw it right in your Bible and just use that as your practice. I'll be doing that with you every day. I'm committing to that alongside you. So I never ask you to do something I wouldn't do. Well, church, would you receive this blessing this morning? May you know the God who wants to use you for his plans. May you know the God who delights in you bearing fruit. And may you know that all of that starts with abiding in him. May you abide in Jesus this week as you go through your days. And now in the words of Psalm 27, wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. And May you wait for the Lord. Church, it is in that hope. You're sent back into God's good world. Hug somebody, tell them you love them. We'll see you next week.